have. When I was a youth pastor years ago, we played a few dangerous games. A couple of them I invented, and I will admit that at least one kid went to the hospital from them. One of them we called scalp them, and you tied a plastic ribbon around your head, and the goal was, in the dark, to get the ribbon off the other student's head. They had a lot of fun and a lot of injuries. So we played that one time, and it was not the most successful and yet the most successful game we ever played. But one game we played more often was the refrigerator box run. And what you would do is you'd bring the students in, you would have teams. So we had, I think in a gymnasium, we had about five teams of six, and we got five big refrigerator boxes. And so the kids would have to get in, the team would help the first kid to get in the refrigerator box. They would have to go down to the wall of the gym. Do you hear how this is going to go? And then run back to their team and then exchange. It was awesome every time. And typically what would happen is the first person you would say go, and they would run as hard as they could right into the wall. And the box would fall over. And it was amazing how much slower the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Of course, some would run into each other. It was the awesomest game because you knew they couldn't see a thing. They, they maybe could see their feet and nothing around them, and they didn't know where they were going. Let me tell you something about you as a Christian living these sermons that we've talked about where love reigns. You live in a world full of darkness, and that darkness looks like anger, it looks like selfishness and self-centeredness. It looks like that cheerleader who took her life just a few weeks ago who said, I am not enough. When you take the box off, when you turn the lights on and you walk in God's love and you have, as First John says, have fellowship with one another in that, what happens? The world says there's something different about that. that. That person knows their value. That person seems to understand something. They're not just out to use me all the time. And so today as we finish this series on Love Reigns, we're going to go back and review some things. And I said to my mom last night after the sermon, I said, how, how was that? And she said, it was phenomenal. I said, even though I literally just reviewed what we talked about, she goes, yeah, nobody remembers what you say. <laughs> she didn't say it that way, but that's what I felt like. It, it, she was actually being very nice, but that's the way I took it because it's your mom, and so you take it the wrong way. My mom is very encouraging, by the way. If you haven't hung around her very much, I would encourage you to get around her. She will inspire and encourage you. Um, when you know what she's walked through in her life and you see her, she really does. So today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the past and those glasses of forgiveness. We talked about that second week. We're going to talk about the mirror of our patterns, how we need to evaluate where we are. And then we're going to talk about our value, our currency in Christ. Ooh, that was a new one. I didn't say that before. I like that. Number one, past, the glasses of forgiveness. And, and here's what, it, I had a label on each of them when I did it the first time, but, but here's the idea. Are you wearing glasses that say who I am in Christ, or do you tend to put on old glasses that say who I was in Christ? There's a big difference, because here's the deal. If you walk around as a Christian and you say, I am a sinner, then if you're not careful, you'll continue to walk in sin and think, well, that's just who I am. It's not a big deal. But if you understand, I was a sinner, but I am saved by grace. And God has forgiven my sins. And he is sanctifying me and making me new. If you walk with those glasses on, you begin to view life differently. So then when you fail and falter, you say, that's not how I am. By the way, they've actually done studies of weight loss programs. And when people say, I'm just a fat guy. And when people say, well, I'm not really, I don't really exercise. When they say things about themselves, they found that it actually impacts how they do. So when people start to think differently about, hey, oh yeah, I'm, a, I'm an exerciser. When they start to think, oh yeah, I go out of my way to try to be healthy, then it actually changes what they do. 
I believe the same thing. If you're over here all the time saying, well, I'm just, I've always been this way. This is just how I am. I'm just a grumpy, mean, whatever person. Then you are saying that's true. And yet the Bible says something totally differently. So let's look at some of these glasses we can put on. 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to stick there for just a minute on this point. For Christ's love compels us. Okay, that word compel, just put that on the shelf because I'm going to come back to that word. It's a cool word, okay? So Christ's love compels us. Why? Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all. Why? So that those who live should no longer, listen to this huge change, live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Listen, you're in a world that assumes anytime you talk to somebody or go out of your way for somebody that you want something for you. And in our flesh, in our natural state, that's how we are. But the truth is, this verse says he compels us. And this word compels is a really cool word in the Greek. And the, the neat thing about Greek words is they have picture meaning. The difficulty is English words don't have picture meaning for the most part. And so our language is pretty plain. And this word compels means that he holds us. It means he pulls us together. And the idea is Christ's love compels us. And then, if it, then it goes on to say to not live in selfishness. He, he compels us to really, listen, listen, to really care about people. Now, if you're not careful, you will slip into old ways of only thinking selfishly and self-centered. And it's all about you and what can you get from somebody and what can you take from somebody. And the saddest thing today is the only Christians you hear about in the news are the ones who lived selfishly and self-centered. You don't hear about the people who lived, bless you, lived entire lives Looking out for the good of others. Rarely do you hear that. Why? Because the news loves when some person claiming to be a Christian does some crazy, unethical, self-centered, horrible thing. And yet, in this verse, it says, he's called us not to just live for ourselves. And so the question for all of us is, have you put on the new glasses that you're really saying, God, help me to see people like you see them? Help me to understand what you understand. God, can you fill me with your love? Because the truth is, in yourself, you don't have love for other people. You're just looking for what you can get. That's normal. You're like that baby. Me! Me, 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 me! We used to joke with the monitors when we'd have the monitors on the stage for the praise team. We, we would joke that, that everybody wants more me. More me, more me, more me, more me, more me, more me. That's why I like inner monitors. You put the inner monitor in, then you can do more me, and nobody else knows you're doing that. The truth is, if we're not careful, we're all that way. More me, more me, more me. Listen to what it says here in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 19. So from now on, we guard no one from a worldly point of view. What's a worldly point of view? What can I get from you? What, what can you give me? And then it continues. Though we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, listen, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, I love this, the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. And then I love this. Listen, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Of all the sermons I've done in the last month, I got more emails, more texts, more calls, had people grab me and say, Eric, you are saying that he has forgiven everything. You're basically telling people that they're righteous. And yet, and yet we've got to, we've got to do stuff. There's a narrow way to God. And if we don't, if we don't obey and do this, and I'm like, that's not what the narrow way means. The narrow one way means that Jesus is the way. Your works are not the way. You need to get over, once again, thinking that somehow you're earning your way to God. You can't earn it. It's like swimming to Hawaii. You need a boat. And Jesus pulls you into the boat. So quit saying you're drowning. Because when you become a Christian, he gives you his righteousness. He, I switched the illustration side. but He gives you his righteousness. He gives you his holiness. Do you deserve it? No. 
Do you still fail and falter? Absolutely. There's times those old habits, like an unclean cup, sneak back in. And you have to say, God, purify my heart. God, would you purify my heart, purify my mind. He makes all things new. But the first step for you is to quit thinking of yourself as the old person you used to be. Quit saying, I'm just a fat guy. Quit saying, oh, I'm just whatever. Listen, you say, God, you're making me new. You're renewing my heart. You're renewing my mind. So the way I used to drive, I no longer drive anymore. The way I used to talk to people, I no longer talk to people that way anymore. That doesn't mean you don't mess up and blow it. But it means that God is renewing you. There is sanctification that happens when Christ takes over. And then there's sanctification that continues to happen as you follow him. Am I walking in God's forgiveness and in his identity. What do you say about yourself? What do you think God thinks about you? Is your main picture of God with his arms crossed going, can't quite get there. You are given his grace, not because you deserve it. And that's why it's the gospel. It's good news because even Paul, who did more religious things than you and I will ever do, knew that he couldn't earn it. It was by grace he was saved through faith. That's why we have the ministry of reconciliation. Number two, we need to, in the present, look at the mirror of our patterns. Now, there are people today, right now, this morning, getting ready for church. And if they're like me, they look in the mirror and went, oh no. Where did this become gray? What happened here? And then I go to the barber and they take off hair and I look on the floor and I'm like, when did that become gray? And then you look a little closer and you're like, what happened there, right? If you're not careful when you look in the mirror, that's all you see. But here's the deal. The Bible talks about how part of what we need to do is look in the mirror of God's word and not just forget what it says. And so every day we need to spend some time looking in the mirror of God's word and say, God, is there any sin in my life? Is there any place where I need to repent? And repent's just a big word for turn around. 180. God, is there any area where I'm pursuing some? Maybe I have unforgiveness. Maybe I have anger in an area. And by the way, there's times that I've had to pray. Okay, God, I know I'm mad about this. And I want to be mad. And I don't want to forgive. God, would you help me to want to, want to forgive? I mean, I'm that far out. Like, God, I don't even want to, want to do what you want. But would you help me? Would you change me? And sometimes we just have to stop and look in the mirror to see where we are. To let the Holy Spirit speak to us about our attitudes towards people. If you haven't in the last year had to go to somebody and go, I am really sorry. Then either you're not hanging around enough people. Or you're not spending time reflecting on how you're acting towards those people. Because there's almost always a time that I have to go, oh no. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. That's a totally new person. It's not just like the transformers. This is the word for uh, worm to butterfly. It's that whole transformation by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Listen, when you're walking in selfishness and self-centeredness and you're praying, God, show me your will, it's very difficult to hear what God wants to say. And here's why. When you say no to God in an area, you're basically saying, I'm not doing that. And then you go, God, would you speak to me? God, would you show me what you want me to do? We well, need to make that area of your life right. La, 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 la. By the way, if you haven't had to do that lately, you're not married. All right, here we go. They come in, want to talk to one of my daughters, and they start talking, and I go, ah, oh, la, 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 la. They're talking girl stuff. I don't want girl. La, 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 la. But we do that with God. God convicts us of sin, and we go, la, 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 la. And then later, we're like, God, would you show me your direction for my life? La, 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 la. He says, Jeff, deal with this. Ephesians 4 says this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, here's what I know about you and about me. 
Here's the difficulty. We begin walking with God. We begin saying, God, I want you to renew my mind, renew my heart. And then all of a sudden, these old patterns grab a hold of us. And you might find that you're stuck in some areas. There's two things. Number one, go out of your way to discover what that is. Ask the Holy Spirit to, re to reveal that to you. Go out of your way to, to find good places to read. There's a book that I always encourage people to read called Changes That Heal. It's by a Christian counselor. And it's the idea of saying, am I stuck somewhere? But then the second part is, you got to get around people. Because sometimes you think you're wonderful. And then a good friend says, uh, did you even know you did this? What? I remember my pastor as a kid used to say, he always thought he was so spiritual in his prayer closet. And then he came out of his prayer closet and he had to deal with his children. And he realized he wasn't as spiritual as he thought he was. We've got to sometimes recognize these old patterns, those old ways of, of sticking in the things that are going on. This is why baptism is so important. It represents this whole idea of dying to yourself. And living for Jesus. That's why one of our 80-something-year-old ladies said, Can I get baptized? I didn't look at her and go, Nope. Because she was saying, I want to demonstrate what's happened in my heart. That I died to me. And I'm living for Jesus. By the way, just a side note. Baptism 630 next week if you want to sign up. Here we go. Am I repenting of old sin patterns and renewing my mind? Number three. The future. I got some fake money. I'm glad it was fake. Rodney would have taken it home. By the way, Rodney, great job this morning. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And got to do Lord's Supper, everything at the same time. Mike Minot did it last night. Did a great job. Steve's on another cruise. Steve, if you're watching, we just want to say we're not jealous. Just tired of No, I'm just kidding. I wasn't even sure where I was going. You ever been swimming in the springs in the middle of Florida? And you grew up in Florida, so you know it's too cold for alligators, probably. Maybe too cold for snakes, but you don't really know. You're not sure. And you're just swimming. And all of a sudden, everybody swims off, and you're by yourself. And regardless of how much you know that there are no sharks, and you're pretty sure there's no alligators, all of a sudden, your brain goes, da 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 -da. And you're like, there's no sharks. Dun, 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 dun. But what is there? Dun, 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 dun. Maybe it's one of those alligator gars. Dun, 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 dun. And your brain just goes all over. You ever had that happen? If we're not careful, that's what we do in life. We tend to go back to the biggest fear we have. What could happen next? What's going to go wrong? And the truth is, for many of us, if we're not careful, if we don't know our value then we just react to everything that comes our way. We don't respond to it with morals. or We, don't, we just react to whatever happens. And we push fear away. And we go out of our way to, to seek entertainment. And to look for ways to be distracted from our fears. Instead of dealing with them. Because we don't understand that regardless of what happens. He values you. So I looked at my teenage daughter yesterday. And I said this. Listen. I said, I know you're getting ready to go to a banquet where they're going to award people for certain things. And I said, I hope you get an award. But I want you to know that whether you get an award or not does not make you more or less valuable. So if you get an award, it all of a sudden is not like, hey, look at me, I'm better than those other people. <laughs> and it's also not like, I didn't get an award Therefore, I don't have as much value. Too many of us are finding our value based on whether we're a mom, whether we're a dad, whether we have a good job or a, what we think is a bad job, whether we have status or the coolest. We find our value in a million different things. And God says, find your value in me. What if everything was taken away from you? Would you know that God still absolutely and completely Loves you and has value for you. Listen, therefore I tell you, Jesus says, don't worry about your life. Boy, that's easy to say, right? Not what you will eat or drink about your body, what you'll wear. It's not life more than food 
Hmm, depends on the day, right? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barn, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then he says this, so hang on to this part. We skip this all the time. Are you not much more valuable than they? The next time, you know, old people watch their bird feeders. And I know I've moved into old people because yesterday I was watching my bird feeder. And it was fun. Better than TV. They got in a fight. The squirrels were coming in for a kill, right? They had a little, they had a little talk. I think they were planning on destroying us. You watch the birds. And every time you see a bird, I want you to think, you know what? God loves you even more, so much more than that bird that you find delight in, which means, you know, God delights in you. God sees you and he's delighted. You have value, not because of what you do, but because of you being you. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, not because we were worked out, because while we were yet sinners, the Bible says, Christ died for us. When you were at your worst, he died for you. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? We actually know now the opposite of that is true. You want to shorten your life? Worry. That'll help you. You can get to heaven much quicker. Now, I don't know if this next quote made it. Is it, is it in here? It's in, my, it's in the notes. It says this, we can trust a faithful father with our fearful future. The next verse, Matthew 6, 33 and 34, Jesus continues and says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Don't, don't make righteousness into a word it doesn't mean, okay? Seek first his kingdom. We kind of understand that. Building the things God wants us to build. What's righteousness? You ready? Doing what's right. Not what's right in our eyes, but what's right in God's eyes. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So if you put God first, he's going to work the other things out. If you put work first, you're going to struggle. Even if you put a wonderful thing like your family first, you're going to struggle. Because what happens when family doesn't do what you think they should do? Has that happened yet? If you have a teenager, you totally get that. Right? Right? If you have a three-year-old, you totally get that. The little jerks, right? And so, and so here's... Did I say that out loud? So, so here's the deal. The truth is, you seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and then He'll work the other stuff out so that when you go through one of these valleys, you'll have peace and joy and assurance knowing that He cares and He loves you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. About 11 years ago, we started this church. And one of the things that happened early on is they were trying to figure out how were they going to pay me. That was fun. And then, and then, very soon, they said, you really need a secretary because you don't know what you're doing. So they said, we're going to hire a secretary. And I remember we had this conversation with a group of leaders, and, I, and they said, how are you going to get paid? I said, I don't know. They said, how are you going to pay your secretary? I said, I don't know. And Mike came for free, so that helped us out. And, and so as we began this church, we said, we're just going to ride the wave. We're just going to catch the wave of what God's doing and figure it out along the way. It's always been true. A few months ago when we said we were going to raise money for chairs, I had two or three people come to me. One person specifically said to me, you're going to be raising money for chairs for years. Okay, thanks. I didn't know how to respond to that one. Another person said, how long do you think this is going to go on? I go, I don't know. I just felt like we're supposed to do chairs, so we're going to do chairs. Three weeks later, chairs are all paid for, and we had enough money to be thicker cushions. And I was like, whoa, that's even better. Now, you don't need to be foolish in your faith, but when you take a step of faith and you know something that God wants you to do, take a step and ride the wave. Do what God's called you to do, whether that's launch a rocket. Is that what I'm hearing? Or whether it's just doing what he's called you to do and checking on somebody. Maybe there's somebody in your family you haven't talked to in years. And maybe the first step for you is to just send them a text and say, I was thinking about you today. Maybe it's to go out of your way just to be a blessing to somebody who you know needs a blessing. Hey, it could even be somebody that you don't even know and you just pay for the person behind you in line at McDonald's. Whatever it is, take that step of faith. 
Put on the, the glasses that say who you are in Christ and that you have value. Take a look in the mirror to make sure that you are transforming your mind as you spend time in God's Word and in prayer. And then take time. Take time to trust Him with the rest of your life and know that you have value, not because of what you do, but because He loves you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're watching online, I'd love to talk to you online. You can send me a text or a quote or a note, and I'd be glad to talk to you. If you're here today, you can come to me after the service. I'll talk to you about what it means to surrender your life to Christ because he died for you. If you're here today and you're a Christian and you've forgotten that you're valuable, I hope that you'll begin to read God's word and just write down some passages that talk about how awesome you are, not because you're awesome, but because he is awesome and he created you and loves you. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you that we have value in you. Thank you that we can seek your kingdom and your righteousness and you will put other things together. May we walk in your presence, in faith, and in love. Lord, I pray for those folks today who do not feel like enough. The ones today who are struggling and they feel like, well, I'm just this way. Lord, I pray that this very day they would just have a glimpse of how deep and wide the love of Christ is for them. Lord, may we, as Paul said, just grab a hold of the depth of your love for us. Thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name.